We are now ready to explore the third and final learning theory that we're going to be looking at in 590, and that is the constructivist theory. I've listed there three theorists who are very much associated with this theory, and that is Jean Piaget, Lev Vygotsky, and Jerome Bruner. So just to review, we've looked at the behaviorist theory, which basically believes we train people to learn by causing behavior changes based on how they respond to certain stimuli. Then we looked at the social cognitive theory, which stated learning happens as a result of multiple things, um, being influenced by key models in one's life, in developing one's own motivation, which are the personal factors, and then setting goals, exploring uh, the world around us, kind of trial and error, reflecting on that, and developing our own sense of self-efficacy. Now, constructivists, if you look at the word construct, the verb means to create. So the constructivist theory is going to basically say, we create our own learning. Remember with the behaviorists, it's basically you're given your learning, right? Based on the stimuli that are presented to you. Here it's you create based on things that are happening around you. So the whole basis of this theory is to look at how people understand the world and how they learn. And some constructivists focus on development, like how people develop as they age. Others focus mainly on the learning aspect. But they all believe that learning starts with the learner's current knowledge, and then it's built on that. And they also believe that it's a very personal experience, that learners construct knowledge for themselves. In other words, constructivists say this explains why you can be teaching a class of 32 students, and maybe you're doing something in language arts and you're reading, you're reading a book, and you have 32 different interpretations of what that book is saying. Constructivists say, yeah, because every student is absorbing what is written in that book based on their own past experiences. So here's just a side-by-side -side comparison so you can take a minute to think about these really are two polar opposites in terms of learning theory. We go from learners being passive and rote here, I'm just feeding you this, you memorize it, we move on, to learners being very active and constructing their own meaning. Um, behaviorism really, learning is isolated. It's just a result of those stimuli. Here, learning is in a context, and it's social, and there's a focus on self-directed learning. And look at the teacher's role. It's to lecture, provide those chunks of information, modify students' behavior right away. Versus in a constructivist classroom, the teacher's role is to set up opportunities for you to learn. So you facilitate those, you observe, you coach, and it's much more individualistic. So let's now look at some of the key constructivist theorists. Piaget is by far the, the best known, and he had five main um, elements that he explored. One, probably the one that he's most famous for, is the stages, the stages of de development. In terms of him looking at how children process the world really depends a lot on age. And remember in those stages, he gives us age ranges, right? We have the sensory motor and the concrete operations. He gives us age ranges, but there are always exceptions to that. And I'm sure you've probably read about those. I'm going to have 
um, an article that I want you to read to just review. But those are important for us as educators because we have to recognize that a student who is six is not at that formal operation stage yet. And so if we try to have our students process or do activities that they're not yet developmentally ready for, they're going to get frustrated, we're going to get frustrated. So we can't rush this. And the cool thing about these stages of development is that they're universal. If you go look at a five-year-old in Russia, a five-year-old in Spain, a five-year-old in Canada, you're going to see very similar developmental um, stages, which is just earth shattering, right? Because we always think, oh, we're so different. Piaget says, no, we're really not. And he suggests that, that children go through these stages right, to help them make meaning out of what is happening around them and to help them understand the world. Then I'm going to talk about schemas. Schemas really is a key um, piece of understanding in terms of how we learn. So schema is plural, schemata is the singular. All right, so when we look at schemas, basically what Piaget said is our brains are pattern-seeking devices. And so we will group, when, when we learn something new, we group all the attributes of that new thing together. So the classic example that's always given is students or young children often interact, at least in the United States, with dogs right, at a very young age. And they realize, oh, dogs have four legs, they have fur, um, they bark, right? they live in the house, sometimes they're outside, those types of things. And all of those things are grouped together to form a schemata. And so we have this, all right, we have this schemata in our brains of what a dog is. And even if a child has developed that based on, let's say the family has a German shepherd. And you know parents, they're like, there's the dog, there's the dog. Well, a child can take that idea, those attributes, and then maybe they're at the park and they see a poodle. And the young child says to the parent, dog? And the parent says, yes, that's a dog, because they recognize, okay, that has four legs, it's barking, it has hair, fur, it's a dog. And that's how we group all of these attributes and things that we're learning. We group them, we cluster them to help make sense of our world. Now, when we, um, let's, let's take the poodle example. When we have something that's slightly new, but it fits into one of our existing schemata, we call that equilibrium. And that means that, okay, even though it looks different than the German Shepherd I have at home, it still is similar enough that it matches my schemata of what a dog is. But what happens if, for example, we see a cat? Maybe it's her first time the child's seen a cat. Well, it has four legs. It has fur. It's being petted, right? It seems like it's friendly to people. And the child says, doggy? And the parent says, oh, no, that's a cat. Then we're in a sense of dis disequilibrium because our previous schemata is not making sense of this cat. When that happens, we basically have three options. So let me show you a graphic here because I think this is helpful. We can assimilate and be like, oh, okay, let me make a new category for this cat because, oh yeah, it doesn't bark right? And we absorb that new um, information into our existing schemata, or we create a new one. Really, creating a new one would probably fit more into the accommodation, or we adapt 
our um, existing schemata to say, oh, okay, I can also have another animal, and later on they'll learn about horses and has four legs, has fur. So we can accommodate that new um, information and adjust our schemata accordingly. Or we can do avoidance, which means we refuse to believe it. We refuse to accept it. And obviously, we want our students to assimilate or accommodate the new information rather than avoidance. But we have seen time and time again that that does happen. Now you'll be reading more about Piaget's work in this module, but I want to go ahead and highlight just a few of the implications, because to me this is where the theory is all important, right? We can learn the theory, but if we don't apply it to what we're doing in our classrooms, it doesn't make sense. So Piaget says, Students need opportunities to make new discoveries. Therefore, the role of the teacher is that we provide a, a wide variety of experiences and contexts to allow students um, to make those new discoveries, to encourage them, to get them to want to learn. And we need to know where our students are developmentally so that we can plan those activities and lessons in order to meet their needs. Also, we need to focus on the process of learning. That's where all of the schema development is going to happen. That's where students are going to accommodate, make new discoveries, rather than just the end product. That's what the behaviorists do, right? Also, Piaget says we need to use collaboration because our students will learn from each other and somebody who's at a different developmental stage can be modeling for a child who's not yet at that stage. But they also need individual activities, time for their own reflection, since everybody processes in a different way. Also, some people might say, well, we need to avoid situations that create disequilibrium for a child. Piaget says just the opposite. We want to have that disequilibrium because that's how students are going to learn. That's how they're going to extend their existing schemata in their brains. And we also need to really understand each student so that we are setting up activities that are appropriate for their developmental levels.